Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Sharper Focus, Wider Lens. My name is Cynthia Jackson Elmore, and I'm the Dean of the Honors College. And we are excited to have you with us this evening, both those here in the auditorium with us and those joining us on live stream. Couple of public service announcements before we begin. Um, first, I just want to let you know that myself personally, I will have to get up a couple times. It will not be because the panelists have said something that has enraged me. I just need to get up, so you may notice that. Also, we wanted to tell you about some upcoming events that may be of interest to you. Thursday, February 16th at 7.30 p.m. and Sunday, February 19th at 1 p.m. There will be an event at the Wharton Center called Among the Darkest Shadows. And it says, through the powerful lens of theater and dance, playwright Jose Cruz Gonzalez tells a stunning tale in the style of magical realism. Weaving the concept of magic as commonplace, we come to know two victims of 21st century human trafficking, Lodi and Pinta. And it goes on to tell you more. If you're here in the auditorium, you may see these on your seats. I encourage you to take them with you. And then our second sharper focus wider lens of this spring, Transforming the World, The Power of Imagination, which will be 7 p.m. Monday, March 27th, again here in the Union and also on live stream. On this evening, we're examining a world on the move, refugees, migrants, and immigrants. And who would have known when we picked this topic it would be so timely and important. And so we're glad that we're able to join the conversation on tonight. And I would like to thank those representatives from the Alumni Association who are here to assist us with the live stream and also acknowledge Stephanie Cpac and John Beck, who are our partners in imagination for sharper focus, wider lens, and ensure that we always have amazing opportunities available for you. I will introduce the panelists, and then they will just go in order. I should warn you that they never have as much time as you would want them to have, and we do that intentionally because our goal is not to answer all the questions, rather to raise the challenges and engage in a conversation, and we really do want to invite you into that conversation. So on this evening, Anna Pegla Gordon will be speaking with us to my very far right. She is an associate professor of social relations and policy in the James Madison College and also director of the Asian Pacific American Studies program here at Michigan State University. Her teaching and research interests include immigration, race, citizenship, visual culture, and popular culture. At James Madison College, she has taught courses in Asian American history, immigration policy, comparative race and ethnic relations, and US racial and immigration history. She has received fellowships for her teaching and research, including national awards from the Organization of American Historians, the Japanese Association for American Studies, and the Immigration and Ethnic History Society. She also received the Teacher Scholar Award here at Michigan State University, as well as an intramural research grant research grant and a Lilly Teaching Fellowship. And she earned her doctorate from the University of Michigan. To her immediate left, David Thronson is Associate Dean for Experiential Education and a professor in the College of Law. He is the co-founder of the Immigration Law Clinic and also served as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. His research and writing seeks to develop frameworks and critical perspectives for analyzing the intersection of family and immigration with a particular focus on children. He currently serves on the National Interagency Working Group of Unaccompanied Children, and his past governmental appointments include service on the Nevada Supreme Court's Access to Justice Commission, the Nevada Law Foundation, and the Nevada Governor's Commission for National and Community Service. And he earned his Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School. In the center of our panel, we have Sophia Kofapulio. She's a fixed term faculty member with the Department of Sociology. And this semester, she teaches international development and refugee crisis, social stratification, and family and society. In 1989, Sophia was one of the very first Greek scholars to pursue in-depth 
field research in neighboring Turkey, through which she explored and developed and described and explained how individuals and families, both Creek and Turkish, forcibly relocated through the terms and conditions of the 1923 Treaty of Lucerne, preserved their identity through the remainder of the 20th century. Since 2003, Sophia has led MSU's contemporary culture, politics, and society in Greece and Turkey study abroad program, which has served over 600 MSU undergraduates that have both traveled, lived, and studied in both Greece and Turkey. Most recently, she was invited to participate on the European Union Government of Turkey sponsored project, Women on the Move, Refugees in Turkey, where she spent time in Turkey visiting refugee camps on the Turkish-Syrian border. She earned her master's degree from the University of the Aegean. Stephanie Nahn is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and the director of academic programs and outreach and engagement for the Center of Gender in Global Context. Her research and teaching areas of expertise are in gender and immigration with the focus on forced migration, exclusion, and social inequality. Since coming to Michigan State, Stephanie has conducted research on community development among immigrants and the importance of social networks and social capital to immigrant and refugee incorporation, as well as the socioeconomic advancement of African-born immigrants in the United States. Through a Fulbright Fellowship in Istanbul, she studies the trafficking of migrants in Turkey, focusing on trafficking in sex and other types of labor. Currently, she is working on the vulnerability of Syrian refugees to trafficking in Turkey. Stephanie earned her doctorate from the University of Southern California. And to my immediate right is Joanna, Johanna, Johanna. Johanna Schuster Craig, an assistant professor of German and Global Studies in the College of Arts and Letters. Her research looks at German integration policies, which aim to incorporate immigrants and refugees into the nation. Johanna uses fieldwork methods with social work organizations in Germany to observe how local residents negotiate these policies. She earned her doctorate from Duke. Each of these individuals have been instructed to not worry about connecting their talks to each other, but simply to present their point of view. That means it lies on me to make the connections. Now, normally that would be a good thing. Tonight I'm feeling a little sorry for you because my brain's not on 100%. <laughs> so I'll do my best and hopefully it'll work. But if we miss any connections, I trust that my collaborators out in the audience will find the points that we missed. And with that, I We'll turn it over to Anna. Anna. Okay. Is this, can you hear me? Great. So thank you so much um, for inviting me here to speak, and thank you everyone uh, for coming. As uh, Dean Jackson Elmore mentioned, I am a historian. So my work is about the past, but I work in the present. And in this presentation, I want to make um, some connections between what we have seen in the past and what we're seeing in this historical moment, particularly the three executive orders that were issued in the first week of Donald J. Trump's presidency. And those three executive orders, as I'm sure you know, concern the border wall and border enforcement, deportation and interior enforcement, and then the travel ban, the Muslim ban, that's received a lot more attention than the first two, but in fact, um, the first two are really a little bit more what I want to focus on today. So the, the first thing I want to say is that in many ways, this is nothing new. Americans have always been ambivalent about immigration. And Americans have always been ambivalent about and against certain groups of immigrants. And the groups may change, but Americans' division about immigration, and we do see that division today, it's not just one story, right? We see both sides. Americans' division about immigration is part of the American tradition. 
The US tradition of immigration is not only that America is a nation of immigrants, and it most certainly is, but it's also that it is a nation of some immigrants, some of the time. And I'm sure you're familiar with this history, the way that English immigrants express concerns about new German immigrants um, right in the founding of the nation. Benjamin Franklin was concerned that they would Germanize Pennsylvania instead of becoming anglicized, and that they would not adopt the English language or culture any more than these swarthy Germans could acquire, as he said, our complexion. English and Germans came to think of themselves as Anglo-Saxon Americans, and these Anglo-Saxons then expressed concern about new Irish immigrants, savage Celts who were unfit for democratic government. And this is actually vividly on display in the basement of the Broad Museum at the moment in an exhibition, The Wearing of the Green, which I highly uh, encourage you to go see. And then the Irish, especially in California, legitimized their own presence in the United States by opposing the immigration of Chinese and other Asian immigrants. They claimed that Asians were undercutting American wages and that they were culturally inassimilable. And, and one thing that actually does happen at this moment in the 1870s in the Asian exclusion movement is that there was a key shift from just opposing the poor quality and limited assimilation of existing immigrants to actually working to prevent their immigration. So as I've said, the US tradition of immigration is not only that America is a nation of immigrants, but also that it is a nation of some immigrants some of the time. And one place where we can see this ambivalent tradition, the inclusionary and the exclusionary tradition is at Ellis Island. And this is, my, my current research is actually focused on Asians uh, at Ellis Island. So as many people know, um, Ellis Island opened in 1892 and it was the largest US immigration station and it is, even today, an iconic symbol of immigration. During the peak years, of immigration from the 1890s to the 1920s, more than 600,000 immigrants entered the United States on average each year. And well over 400,000 of them came through Ellis Island, so more than two thirds. Ellis Island was the central location through which most immigrants entered because it was the US government's first border control station. It was designed not to let immigrants in, but to keep some immigrants out. And if we think about the recent executive order on the border wall and border enforcement, I would argue that Ellis Island is itself part of that tradition. Prior to 1875, there were no restrictions on immigration. Everyone who came to the United States came legally because it was impossible to come illegally. Um, but from 1875 to 1892, when Ellis Island opened, the US government issued laws to prevent the entry of Chinese immigrants, coolies, criminals, prostitutes, lunatics, idiots, paupers, poor immigrants, polygamists, contract laborers, immigrants suffering from loathsome or contagious diseases, and those convicted of misdemeanors involving moral turpitude. These laws needed to be enforced, and Ellis Island was built for that purpose. Immigrants were taken to the station to be questioned about whether they met the new requirements and to be checked for signs of mental or physical illness. Now, only between one and three percent of Ellis Island arrivals were rejected during this time, but it's important to remember that this border enforcement station was built to prevent the entry of those unauthorized immigrants. The second part of the recent executive order on building a wall instructs the Secretary of Homeland Security to, quote, immediately construct, operate, and control detention facilities along the border. And this is also paralleled in the history of Ellis Island, which was not only a border enforcement station, but also a detention center. 
Typically, during the peak years of immigration, about 15% of immigrants were detained for brief periods of time while their cases were being reviewed. However, after the 1920s, when new restrictions banned all Asian immigrants and prevented the entry of almost all Southern and Eastern European immigrants, as well as actually just reducing the overall number of immigrants that were allowed into the United States, Ellis Island stopped being used primarily as a border enforcement station and became a detention and deportation center. Now, most histories today don't acknowledge this past at all. They focus only on the iconic Ellis Island, one history of the station, and it's, it's very typical of, of histories that I read and that you may have read, states that, quote, after 1924, immigration slowed to a trickle and Ellis Island fell into disuse. It was closed in 1954. And I love the passive voice there. It's like, you know, immigration slowed to trickle. We didn't actually pass laws to prevent people from coming. It just slowed to a trickle. However, during this time, Ellis Island's role was well known and widely acknowledged. The station had dining and sleeping accommodations for up to 2,000 detainees. And especially in the 1930s, when deportation was massively expanded, it was common for these facilities to be filled overnight. And in my research on Asians at Ellis Island, I learned, it was interesting to learn, that there were actually separate dormitories for white, Asian, and in the words of the time, colored detainees. In 1936, Harper's Weekly wrote that, quote, almost no immigrants go through Ellis Island in person. Only their records are filed there. The island is America's chief deportation depot. In the 1940s, the US Coast Guard reported that, quote, contrary to a popular idea, Ellis Island is not used as an immigration station. It is a detention center. Perhaps the clearest example of this came during World War II, when Japanese, German, and Italian enemy aliens were interned for months and even years on the island. And the New York Times wrote that, quote, Ellis Island has a concentration camp of its own. Now, these are only brief glimpses into the ambivalent tradition of Ellis Island, but they help us see the ways that it is not only an iconic symbol of America's inclusive immigration tradition. Like America itself, Ellis Island also has a hidden history of border enforcement, detention, and deportation. I started by saying that in many ways this historical moment is nothing new, that Americans have always been ambivalent about immigration and Americans have always been ambivalent about and against certain groups of immigrants. But I do believe there are ways in which this moment is new. And I'm going to turn to my colleagues who focus on the contemporary moment to explore more about the issues that we face today. Thank you. I want to talk about a, a, a situation we don't talk about often enough, which is the flow of refugees coming to our borders. And by that, I don't mean people showing up at airports, the Syrians where we've had massive protests in airports around the, the country, where people have turned out for people who are stopped under one of the current executive orders, and they have shown great support and, and uh, pushed for the entry of people into the United States in that situation. Um, we geographically in this country are quite removed from some of the places that we think of as the big refugee producing regions of the world. It's hard to get here from Syria. It's hard to get here from Somalia. It's hard to get here from Pakistan. And we can all show up at the airport where people are coming in on planes. But closer to home we have a current refugee flow that, that people don't talk about enough. And these are refugees coming from Central America, coming on foot, hitching rides on trains, finding their way with smugglers to our borders and, and across our borders into the United States. And 
This is happening now, it's happening regularly, and the characteristics of this flow of immigrants have shifted over the last several years, in that the biggest groups coming to this country are unaccompanied children. 60,000 children almost, 59,000 and change, came to our borders unaccompanied, separated from any adults, any parents, any support. And some of these are older teens coming of their own volition, maybe looking for family members or parents in the United States to reunite with them. Some of them are, are just looking to uh, get out of horrible situations back in their home countries. Most of them are coming from what we refer to as the Northern Triangle, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, three countries in um, Central America, murder capitals of the world, places where gangs have strong power and look to recruit young people as they're coming into uh, age and uh, young women are recruited into gangs. There's incredible violence uh, incredible lack of a rule of law so that young people look and say, you know, I have no life here. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to face persecution if I stay. I'm going to be killed if I stay. It's time for me to go. I'm going to go and seek safety. And part of why we know that that, that is true is, is people who are on the ground. This is not some far away place where we wonder what's going on. This is a place where people go and see and, and witness what's happening. Um, we also know that that journey is not benign. I don't know if people saw the Super Bowl commercial. I didn't watch the Super Bowl, but I watched the commercials about immigrants, right? And uh, one of them had a mother and a daughter, you know, getting up and, you know, today's the day and, you know, nice happy journey to the United States. Um, very upbeat. And if you go to the website, um, the door opens. There's the wall and the door opens when they get there and they're welcomed in. Well, that's not the experience that, that young people traveling on their own from Central America have coming to the United States. Um, this is not a safe journey. Children die along the way. They're injured. They lose limbs falling off, off trains. And they're sexually assaulted. They're robbed. They're beaten. Um, they're trafficked. And all kinds of awful things happen. But they're coming because what they left behind is worse. And they're making that choice and saying, you know, this is the logical choice for me to come here. Now, we hear sometimes, and I don't know if you all hear, about that journey, about La Bestia, the train. Um, Sonia Nazario was here um, and talking about her wonderful book, and Enrique's Journey, um, earlier this year. And we think about what's happening in that situation. But what we don't hear about is then, well, well what happens when they actually get here? What happens after they reach the United States? Um, because part of why we have this group, in particular, coming in large numbers, is that smugglers are good business people. And if you smuggle an adult into the United States, they don't want to get caught. They'd like to get in. If you smuggle a child into the United States, you get them across the border, and you leave them and then you wait for someone on the border patrol to come and pick them up. And they're gonna pick them up and they're gonna put them in custody. And then we start this long journey and this long process where children are sorted of many different ages. We check, where are they from? Are there family members back home they can be sent back to? Are there family in the United States they can be released to? If there's not family, is there a family friend? Is there someone we trust? Were they traveling with another person? And we can send them along with that child to connect with their family. Where can we put them? And if we don't have a place to put them, um, we're going to put them in a, a foster care system here in the United States. Now, this sounds like we've got to focus on how we're going to care for this child. And on one hand, we do. Right? We say, well, you know, how are we going to make sure that this child is put in a setting where they're not um, where they start, which is in a lockdown detention center. That's where these kids start their experience with the United States. The door doesn't just open, they're, they're detained, they're in jail. And they're held while this process goes on, and then they're released, if we can find someone to release them to, 
or to a program. But while this process is going on, we've got a parallel process going on, which is to deport them from the United States. They're served with a notice to appear. Just several days ago, we got a new memo from the Executive Office of Immigration Review, the office that oversees our immigration courts, which reaffirmed that children who are in these you know, custody situations remain an enforcement priority. So when you hear about enforcement priorities in this country, um, that's not just the hardened criminals, the so-called uh, bad hombres out there, right? Um, children who arrive in this country are an enforcement priority designated as such by our government. And they're put into removal proceedings. And in that removal proceeding, the government has a very easy burden. They charge. This is a child who's not a US citizen. The child's present in the United States without a visa or other piece of paper that says that they're allowed to be here. They don't have any right to stay. They're deportable. That's almost always true in these cases. The starting point is these children are deportable. They arrived without status. But then they need to make a claim. How are they going to be permitted to stay? Can they claim asylum? Can they claim that they're a victim of trafficking and therefore entitled to some relief? Can they claim a, a form of relief called special immigrant juvenile status, which allows them to navigate through our family courts and get some relief and some findings made that permit them to get some immigration status. Now the remarkable thing about this journey, where children deal with representatives of the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, CBP, Customs and Border Protection, deal with representatives of HHS, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. They deal with officers of the Department of Justice, ICE trial attorneys um, from Homeland Security, immigration judges from the Department of Justice. And all through this process, they don't get a lawyer. You can be four years old and you don't get a lawyer. You have a right to an attorney, but no one's gonna provide one for you. And so we have this process where, on one hand, we're saying, yes, we've got children. We're going to try and treat them as children. We're gonna try and provide for care for them. But then we've got all the power of the United States government lined up to say, how do we prove that this child's deportable? And we're gonna send them back. How are we gonna make sure that, that we're doing everything we can? The num amount of resources that we put into a system that seeks to deport children is phenomenal. And yet, the one thing we don't have in that system is, is an attorney for the child. So, I'll stop there, I'm, I'm out of time. And uh, I think we're gonna turn to Europe. Tonight is the night of the hard truths and also at the same time sad stories. So uh, my presentation today it is about the current refugee crisis that the island of Lesbos uh, experienced and still experiences. And I have a short movie which I will not show because of the time restrictions but I strongly recommend to you, if you have two minutes, uh, uh, go to YouTube uh, or Vimeo and watch it. So how do refugees come to Lesbos? And I'm taking the example of Syria, because during the summer of 2016, according to EASO, the European Asylum Office, they have been uh, uh, recognized 70, 70 different nationalities that they were asking for asylum uh, in Greece. So in the case of Syria, according to UNHCR, we have, uh, it is estimated that there is a, a, a number of 35,000 people that they are involved 
into the smuggling of uh, Syrian refugees to Europe. And uh, you can see that uh, orange uh, uh, island. This is the island of Lesbos. The closest uh, source of Lesbos to Turkey are 5.6 nautical miles. So there are different ways that they come, either uh, at the beginning on foot and then by buses, or uh, uh, during 2015 they were leaving to Mersin by boat and then by buses to Izmir. And then one night, uh, the smugglers, they put them in minibuses, they leave them to the shores, uh, and then uh, they put them to those uh, plastic boats that I'm sure you have seen them in the news, uh, that they are usually designed uh, to carry 12 people, but uh, actually uh, they put as many as they can, if you will think that every head uh, uh, is $1,000. Now, uh, how I did this research, I started as a volunteer during 2015, and then uh, after the crisis continued, uh, I decided to work uh, uh, also as a researcher. Uh, already we discussed about uh, uh, my affiliation with the island, and obviously from my accent, I'm native Greek, and I am an immigrant to this country. I came in 93. What is the methodology that I have used? Uh, field work, uh, interviews. Uh, I used uh, statistics from UNHCR mainly. Uh, and also, I have, uh, at the end, I will say that my overall approach is serendipity and autoethnography. Uh, key concepts. There are several key concepts that I will use. I will not uh, uh, discuss them now uh, because I don't have the time. But what I really would like to share with you, it is the chronicle of the refugee crisis in Lesbos and then answer to the question why Lesbos is an island of solidarity. So by January, from January to March uh, 2015, we have uh, in an average of uh, 800 people that they arrived to the island. And this they were viewed by the locals as the wanderers, if we will use uh, Georg Zimmel's uh, term, because they were arriving, they were walking through the streets, they were going, uh, to the camp, uh, and then after they were getting their papers, they were getting the first boat to go to Athens and then uh, go to Europe uh, through the route of the Balkans. Then from April to August, we have the huge numbers that they started to arrive. We are talking about from 3,000 to 7,000 people every uh, month. Um, Immediately, the locals, they started to react, mainly in a positive light. We have a lot of individual acts of kindness. Uh, for example, people are eating in a restaurant and they see a bunch of people walking, they immediately invite them to eat with them, or they open their houses. And we have a repeated example that they open the houses during the night and they bring 40 people to sleep in their house because they feel sorry about these families. But at the same time, we have the local uh, non-governmental organizations that they started to uh, do certain things uh, much more uh, uh, organized. By August 2015, what the British call cucumber time, it is the time that the media, the international media, cuts the situation in Lesbos. And it is at that time that uh, we have uh, the first arrival of independent volunteers. Meanwhile, already UNHCR, IRC, they started to arrive uh, from the end of June but really, they didn't do uh, a lot of things they were trying to settle in. 
By September, that movement started to become bigger. We have the arrival of massive numbers of the outsiders. And I use again the term of uh, Zemel because this is how uh, those uh, independent or even INGO members, uh, they were viewed by the locals. I will explain a little bit why. Uh, now, the Greek government uh, uh, was very supportive to the refugee issue at the beginning, but after a certain point, uh, it was obvious that things started to change in Europe. Uh, and this is where the Greek government uh, invites the other political parties from the parliament to come together to a common decision of how they will handle the refugees. And uh, finally, we have the European-Turkish agreement, which has been heavily criticized and denounced by all the international organizations, including UNHCR. So, but still, what the European-Turkish agreement did, it created a lot of paradox. So you have uh, a family that the father arrives on the 19th with the sons, and after the 20th, on the 20th, if the mother and the girls, they will arrive on the 21st, they immediately are detained into a camp. So the same family, you have half of them free and half of them closed in the camp. So still, that European agreement stopped the numbers of the people that they were arriving in Lesbos. So in some, uh, uh, some weeks, especially during the June, we had uh, an arrival of 25 or 30 people. But it was the Turkish coup that changed everything. I put it in quotations because uh, for a lot of different reasons, I can answer to you if you are interested but it is the Turkish coup that actually changes these uh, 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 numbers. And suddenly we started to have bigger numbers, but at this uh, uh, moment, the numbers, the nationality of these people are mainly Africans. And uh, with the help of Stephanie that she will discuss about Turkey, we will figure out why Africans. What is the situation now? They are viewed by some of the Greeks as strangers, but the in important thing it is uh, that these refugees, uh, they consider themselves uh, as wanderers. In other words, they don't want to stay in Lesbos. They want to leave Greece. They uh, experience the economic crisis that the Greek people have. Uh, I have some numbers here and I have a lot of uh, different pictures to understand uh, how was uh, the port of Mytilene between 2014 and 2015, where in a in a, Mytilene has a population of 25,000 people, 20,000 people refugees, they were staying in tents uh, in the uh, Port of the uh, uh, Mediterranean. Now, why Lesbos is the island of solidarity? It has to do with the island's social history, both refugee and migration experience. Let's not forget uh, that uh, the island was connected with the modern Greek state in 1912. We have uh, a huge population of Asia Minor Greek Orthodox that they moved there because of the Lausanne, ex uh, the Lausanne exchange of population. Secondly, perhaps this sounds to you strange because history has taught us that in moments of Greek econ of, uh, economic crisis, everybody tries to support himself and everybody becomes more individualistic. Actually, in this specific case, it worked in the opposite. People were felt, uh, locals, they felt very happy for what they had, the roof that they had under their head and the bread on their table, and they were willing to share it with these people. 
the important role of different uh, grassroots movement, the government, which was very supportive of that time, and believe it or not, the local mayor, despite the fact that he belongs to a right-wing anti-immigrant party. There are more uh, ideological reasons that created that uh, uh, I, uh, Lesbos as the island of solidarity that I can discuss with you because my time is over. But uh, one sentence, I think uh, that this presentation is more than ever important because of what is happening in our country nowadays. Thank you. Well, thank you all for, for setting me up here for a great talk. Thank you uh, for inviting me and thank you all for, for coming. So um, I, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the Syrian uh, Syrian refugees, but uh, kind of more broadly about my, my background and, and research I've done with refugees. So um, in, in the US as well as in Turkey. So um, you know the Syrian conflict, everyone has heard about this now, it's produced the largest refugee population since World War II. Uh, frequently referred to as a refugee crisis, right? Advocates rightly point out that it is a crisis not of refugee migration, but of states that are unwilling to provide sufficient protection. Globally, we think of super governmental organizations like the United Nations High Commission for Refugees as managers of these refugee flows and assistance, but it's states where the power to help or hurt refugees really lies. States have been the dominant institutions for ensuring the rights of people, but are of course implicated in the creation of this category of people we call refugee. It's the failure of a given state that produces the refugee in the first place. But in the process of protecting refugees from the failure of that state, then another state needs to step in to ensure that person's, that refugee's rights. However, it's common for other states to fail in that regard as well. We've seen this play out in stark relief with uh, the many states in the EU refusing to allow refugees to enter and or failing to properly protect them once they've entered the boundaries of the state. And we have seen this most recently in the Trump administration's executive order barring refugees from entering the US, even those that have already been vetted and awarded proper visas. And if you would like to know about the extreme vetting we already put refugees through, I've written about this, lots of people have written about this, I'm, I'm stunned at how, when you ask someone who thinks the process isn't secure enough, you ask, well, what, what do you think would be a secure process? And they inevitably describe a process that is less secure than what we currently have, because people don't actually know what we do. Uh, but uh, as uh, Professor Pegla Gordon pointed out, this is not a new phenomenon. The creation of the UNHCR itself was in many ways an attempt at addressing failures of states, and much of the work of the UNHCR continues to be trying to get states to simply meet the obligations of protection to which those states themselves had agreed. This is in fact the source of the so-called refugee crisis. Large flows of refugees across a nation state border over a relatively short period of time will inherently create challenges, but it only becomes a crisis when the receiving state refuses to provide protection to those refugees, and other states refuse to provide uh, minimal or, or provide no support to the receiving state in providing protection and assistance. So within this gap of protection that's left by states, NGOs have moved into the space between refugees and rights, becoming a conduit for refugees to access the rights that they have on paper, which they are un otherwise unable to access. I focused my work on social citizenship rights, which I think are increasingly important in the advancement of neoliberalism, and also provide uh, the social uh, citizenship rights provide an underpinning to other types of rights and citizenship. So what I mean by social, social citizenship entails the rights to be in a state and to enjoy the resources of that state. While not having political rights, such as the right to vote in elections, refugees can still have social rights, such as the right to a public education, 
the right to subsidies for food and housing, etc. Social citizenship rights have deteriorated for all of us under neoliberalism, as states have withdrawn from providing social citizenship rights and increasingly have left it to the free market to provide those rights. So in other words, what the state used to provide to people as a benefit of being a member of that state, we now increasingly have to pay for privately as individuals. The Flint water crisis is a pivotal example of this, in which the residents of Flint cannot rely upon the state to simply provide clean drinking, safe, clean drinking water through the pipes that the state owns and controls. And instead, they must purchase uh, clean water privately. Refugees have felt the erosion of social citizenship perhaps most acutely because citizens of a state use refugees' foreignness or their lack of political citizenship to argue against refugees' access to social citizenship. And this is why NGOs have become critical to filling the social citizenship gap. In the United States, NGOs serve as an important mechanism for refugees to access resources of the state. This includes everything from securing a place to live, obtaining various forms of documentation that you need for absolutely everything, uh, to enrolling their children in school. In some places where the state is much weaker than it is in the US, NGOs are the only possible source of resources. Uh, Dr. Brianne Grace's work demonstrates how some Somali uh, Bantu refugees who have failed to receive adequate resources in Tanzania, and Tanzania gave them legal citizenship, they've instead uh, abandoned that citizenship in Tanzania and have moved back to Somalia, a country with virtually no government, in order to avail themselves of resources provided by the international NGOs that are operating there. She calls this NGO citizenship. And I expect we will see more and more examples of this type of citizenship as states either fail or refuse to take on social citizenship obligations to individuals within their boundaries. So I want to give some examples from my research, uh, both in Turkey and the United States, and how NGOs have served as conduits for social citizenship, highlighting some of the particular problems uh, with the androcentric way in which rights are insured and how refugees have circumnavigated these problems as they agentively pursue social citizenship rights. So I'll start with Turkey. There are nearly three million registered refugees in the country of Turkey. Uh, that's three million registered. There are a lot more that are not registered. And to provide some context for that, imagine that in the United States, we had about 50% more unauthorized migrants than we do right now. They all entered the country within a period of five years, really three to four, and almost all of them are absolutely destitute. That's, that's what's happening in Turkey right now. In 2014, the government of Turkey implemented the Law on Foreigners and International Protection with the intent of regularizing temporary protection of Syrians and giving them access to certain resources of the state, including the legal right to work. Um, and Sophia had, had made some reference to me talking about Africans. I didn't actually have uh, uh, plans to talk about Africans, but I will say <laughs> that the, um, the, the law on foreigners and international protection has provided both uh, one set of rights for Syrian refugees and a different and hmm. lesser set of rights for non-Syrian refugees. And this has kind of mirrored other refugee policies where Syrians, because of their large numbers, have been sort of privileged within the hierarchy of refugees. And, and no surprise, the black market on Syrian passports has skyrocketed. So uh, somewhere between a third and a half of the Turkish labor force uh, works informally. So many people in Turkey who are citizens are not able to work in the formal labor market. So providing formal labor rights to Syrians has not provided a legal pathway to self-sufficiency. Uh, consequently, Syrians frequently work in highly exploitive situations, and most experts agree that situations meaning the definition of human trafficking are common. There are many Syrian women who are unable to leave their homes because of the significant care responsibilities they have for young children or infirm family members. And uh, those without male family members are that can go out and work are particularly vulnerable. Uh, there aren't good data yet on what happens to these women without male family members. Uh, but there are whispers constantly about these women doing sex work in their homes. 
an act of desperation so shameful that it's difficult to get women to admit that they're doing this and thus difficult to provide them help. The situation is further exacerbated by a weak civil society that is not capable of advocating for rights of Syrians beyond what the Turkish state already provides. Uh, the government of Turkey generally is pretty hostile towards, uh, or I shouldn't say hostile, very tight-fisted about allowing international NGOs to enter the country. It's very difficult, and once they get there, they have to be very careful about being adversarial with the Turkish government. So in the United States, by contrast, has a large and well-developed civil society with a long history of NGOs partnering with the government. But, um, and we don't limit uh, labor force participation of immigrants. We require it, and with refugees, we require it fairly quickly. Uh, like in Turkey, there's minimal state resources that are available for refugees in order to access uh, social at rights uh, and resources, you have to purchase them. Uh, the US can more consistently provide things like schooling for refugee children, but most other resources uh, under neoliberalism are very privatized. Kin and ethnic ties often fill the gaps for NGOs, uh, both in the US and in Turkey. Uh, uh, a few Syrian women in our study in Istanbul have found uh, money-making ventures through sympathetic Turkish women who are often the wives of the landlords or the, the handyman that work, work in the building. Um, but again, these, these uh, opportunities come uh, by accident and good fortune. There's no real way to, you know, right now to regularize them having access to uh, you know, uh, any sort of, of money-making ventures that are safe and, and not exploitative. So in sum, NGOs are filling a citizenship gap left by neoliberal states that seek to minimize their obligations to refugees, but the gaps are not completely filled. NGOs have not been perfect replacements for states, uh, just, uh, not just in terms of political power, but in, um, in the, the resources that they're able to provide. I want to say that many people in this room are probably doing many things for refugees, volunteering, providing assistance, providing social networks, providing material aid. You should keep doing that. It is impactful, it's important, but it's also no substitute for the state, which can provide not only more complete assistance than we all can as private citizens, but can provide the legal protection that really is undergirding uh, refugee assistance in the world. Thank you. So this is an incredible panel of people to sit next to and talk to you about. And I must confess, after hearing all of their talks, I am slightly concerned about my tone for what I will be presenting to you. Um, but. I'm starting also to think, given what appears in my news feed every day, that maybe uh, laughing at the absurdity of the situation might be a revolutionary act. <laughs> so here goes. Um, I am always interested in the kind of research that I do in what happens after the moment people move. So what, what happens after you've settled somewhere? Um, how do you cope? How do you deal with what brought you to a new place? Now, Germans all often talk about integration. They have a whole host of public policies called integration politics. And this is supposed to represent a whole host of policies and discourse and networks that bring people, incorporate people into the German state. And here is how they define that. Supposedly, you don't have to give anything up if you come to Germany and you integrate. You do have to integrate. The Germans see that as a long-term process. Their goal is to incorporate everybody who's there legally so that there's no gaps. And by integrating, this makes it possible for you to participate in society. And in order to do that, what they demand of immigrants is that you learn German, you learn the German constitution. That's a huge task, given that the Germans don't have an actual constitution. They have a basic law. So I'm not quite sure why they put that in the definition. Um, and then you have to learn how to respect and follow the letter of the German law. Um, so that raises the question, well, how does integration happen? It sounds reasonable, right? 
Well, it is different in different places, and I'm going to switch in this presentation between Germany and Switzerland because they have some similar policies and some similar language. And so here's a picture, actually, um, from a Swiss campaign to make integration easier and to make naturalization <laughs> easier. So if you are integrated in Switzerland, you qualify for easy, in, easy naturalization, and I guess that that means that you vote, you're a white woman who skis, and you eat fondue. <laughs> um, I am being a bit of a bit of an ass, if I can say that on the live stream. Um, but you get the gist. Integrating into Switzerland means that you do Swiss things. Now, what does that mean in Germany? Um, I'm going to show you a one-minute clip from the first comedy. I told you it was revolutionary. The first comedy about uh, German Turks in Germany. It came out in 2010, and it's called Almania. Welcome to Germany. And this scene is at the very beginning of the film. There are two elderly German Turks, probably in their early 70s, Hussein and Fatma, and they are getting ready to naturalize and become Germans. And how does this play? Not that way. That way. There we go. So. Herr und Frau Yilmaz. Jetzt fehlt nur noch der Punkt 4 auf Anhang 18. Verpflichten Sie sich, als baldige deutsche Staatsbürger die deutsche Kultur als Leitkultur zu übernehmen. Sehr schön, das bedeutet, Sie werden Mitglied in einem Schüsselverein, essen zweimal eine Woche Schweinefleisch, Sie sehen jeden Sonntag Tatort und verbringen jeden zweiten Sommer auf Mallorca. Sind Sie bereit, diese Pflichten auf sich zu nehmen? Aber, äh ja, natürlich, muss ja alles richtig haben. Warte mal. Ich gratuliere. Sie sind jetzt Deutsche. Ja, mal sehen. Hoppte nicht so. Wir sind doch immer noch Türken. <laughs> Good, we got, we got some of that, that steam out. So Hussein just wakes up after a bad dream where becoming a German means that you have to eat pork, you join a rifle club, and you watch German crime dramas every weekend. I'm showing you humorous satires because I really do think that that's the best way to illuminate some of the tension underlying integration policies and integration politics. Now, it is great and necessary. I really do believe it's necessary to create some kind of policy which allows newcomers to participate in and have access to civic and cultural life of whatever nation they have settled in. You have to learn a new language. You need to have access to citizenship. You need to have access to gainful employment. I'm so glad that the United States demands this of refugees because that's the motor of integration in uh, scare quotes. These are the values of many in immigrant and settler societies. Um, where there's tension is when, rather than advocating for participation and, s and access, integration starts to become coded as cultural assimilation. Mm -hmm. And so I brought some pictures from Germany about how this happens. I'm going to show you some collections of images that show some common cultural tropes. Um, the first one, Germans are very proud of their Autobahn, where you can ride without speed limits. Sigmar Gabriel, who is the foreign minister of Germany, apparently told Donald Trump this when he met with him last week. He was the first German official to come to the United States, told him how great Germany was. Um, and these signs say that they want immigrants to take the right exit. They want you to go towards integration. They want you to go away from exclusion, from parallel societies, or for isolation. Um, you know anything about Germany? You also know they love soccer. Soccer will save us as long as we all play on the same team. It's beautiful pictures of a very diverse group. If you want to learn more about soccer and this kind of integrative politics, I recommend Laurent Dubois' book, Soccer Empire. It's really engaging. It says a lot of great stuff. Um, purportedly, integration also means contact. So reach out and touch somebody. Um, the connected, diverse hands, they appear in all sorts of contexts. Um, this is the most common trope that I see when they don't want to show faces or they don't want to show some kind of a graphic. 
Now, it is not always so cuddly. There are other campaigns, some other marketing campaigns that show integration in a way that chooses to accentuate, in my opinion, the kind of differences that people may have. Um, these are stock photographs that you can download from one of the graphic producers in Germany. And <clears throat> they also use the word integration, not just to talk about the integration of foreigners, but also to talk about the integration of anyone with any kind of a disability. Um, some people have made some aesthetic representations of integration. This is uh, by an artist on Flickr. The title of this is Integration. I find this terribly threatening as a visual image to be singled out for difference and then enclosed by a group of people that do not share your difference. Um, the far right, and I'll show you a Swiss example, also relies on uh, these similar kinds of ideas. These are some recent campaigns that uh, were from before the large amounts of refugees started to come to Europe. Um, you, in these images, the one with the sheep says creating security, and there's a white sheep on the Swiss flag kicking out the black sheep. Um, this is from the Swiss People's Party, which is a far-right party. Um, all of these are not only predicated on an us-them binary, we are different from someone else, they are not like us, but it also means there is no hope that they will ever become like us, and so there is no point in actually having them here. Um, everything that I've shown you up until this point is from before there was a large influx of refugees into Germany. Um, so what happened? What changed in 2015? In sep on September 4th, Angela Merkel, apparently over breakfast at a kitchen table, was negotiating with some leaders about what to do about the situation in Hungary. In Hungary, I'm hungry. Um, Hungary, <laughs> and um, she, in consultation with the then uh, Austrian president, she decided to open up Germany's borders. Um, over a million people decided to enter Germany. About half of them decided to apply for asylum in Germany. The other people uh, may have gone on to other destinations like Denmark or Sweden. And um, you have this beautiful picture of Angela Merkel that was circulating, taking selfies with all these refugees at the beginning of September. She is now facing election and is trying to uh, deport people as rapidly as she possibly can because people have not been happy with her decision. Um, now, for me, what's interesting as a scholar is that refugees and permanent immigrants, they have different needs, they're different populations, um, but the discourse about them is pretty much the same in Germany these days. I think that this happened for two reasons. So, they had long called to integrate permanent, permanent immigrants, immigrants who had been there for a long time, and now they are calling to integrate refugees. How are we going to integrate refugees? Um, so Germany already has a long-standing Muslim minority. A great deal of the incoming refugees are Muslim from places like Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iraq or Syria. So these groups were seen as equivalent, even though their histories are different and their needs are different. Because of the number of people entering Germany and the conservatism of the far right, which is gaining power, a lot of politicking was focused on saving culture. How do you save German culture from this influx of large numbers of people? And this is the kind of cultural discourse that takes us back to the film clip. Um, if you want to naturalize, we want you to eat pork, and we want you to speak German. Germans in 2015, they already had a cultural apparatus in place, which hit both of these points, and that's the apparatus of integration. So, what happened is that they passed their first integration law in 2016, which was designed to promote and target refugee populations. And I'll end with this quote that's at the top of this um, photograph. Angela Merkel said, for the first time in the history of the Federal Republic of Germany, we are putting forth a federal law for integration, which is based on the principle of encouragement, that sounds nice, and demands. That sounds less nice. Um, so Germany in this law will both encourage and demand that refugees integrate if they want to stay. Some of the encouragement means subsidies, means housing, means um, laws of family togetherness. But some of the demands mean that your subsidies can be cut if you don't learn German fast enough or well enough. It means that the government can determine where you live, whether or not that's close to family or not, and it can also determine how long or how frequently your residency permit can be renewed. Thank you.
thank you to all of the panelists. And before we give them an opportunity to see if there's any quick cross talk and open up, just want to throw to the floor some observations that I had as I listened to the panelists. And, and one was the importance of using our past to inform the present, not just studying history, but then using history to shape what we do and bringing to light the ambivalence that has always existed in this country and likely others about immigration and the in-group versus the out-group. That we are a nation of immigrants, but the question becomes which immigrants are deserving, right? And each new group has to prove their worthiness before we accept them into society. And then the question of what are the welcoming places, the immigration stations, the border controls, what role do they really play? And is it about who comes in versus who do we keep out? And a lot of times we focus on the flow of refugees, the flow of immigrants, and we look off into the distance to the, the big, bad, whatever, right? And not realizing that people transfer across our borders for a whole host of reasons, and some closer to home than we actually acknowledge all of the time, but that the nature and composition of who those individuals are can be shocking. And so we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, let's keep out the people who aren't contributing to society, they're not working, or they're taking jobs away, and yet there is a large number of children who come into the country, and what do we do with those children? And keeping in mind that the journey is uninviting, and it's unsafe, and then they land here, they cross our borders, and the welcoming is equally unsafe in a land that we said in the US is the home of the masses. So what does that mean? And then how do we look out to other countries and have a conversation with them about how welcoming they are or aren't? The theme of refugee smuggling runs through all of this, and then what happens to individuals. And then also thinking about what's the role of communities? individuals and organizations in helping people settle? And what's the tipping point for when we say we're going to accept certain refugees, certain immigrants, or a certain number? When does it become too much? And when are they the wrong groups of people? And the whole issue of detainment. What does detainment really achieve and what are we trying to get at? I thought it was interesting about how we talk about conflict leads to crisis and then we have refugees, when actually the real crisis comes after there are refugees and how we treat them, and we being the global world. And then the failure of one state. And so as Stephanie was talking about this before she actually got to it, immediately the political scientist went to me and said, this is government failure, right? We talk about market failure and government failure. But what's the role of the government? And when the government stops doing what we expect it to do, who steps in? Well, the market's not stepping in here, so it has to be civil society, the third rung, and what do we do to support civil society? And recognizing that social rights do not depend on political rights. And how do we acknowledge basic human rights? And then thinking about how do we help individuals cope with their own transition, their own settlement? And is integration really integration, or is it assimilation? There's not too many places on this globe that can say integration has truly been integration. We've always said, if you want to stay here, you have to be like us, and you have to give up whatever you came from. So what does that mean? And I truly loved the ability for us to, to laugh, right? To step back and just take a look at the absurdity of the rules that we put in place, the perspectives we take, and then we ask people to want to be like us when, and the us is again the global us, when the example we set forth says we don't value you as a human being, but yet you should want to come and play in our sandlot, right? And so what does that mean? And how do we make sure that we're not guilty of the othering ourselves? And how do we truly embrace? And so with that, I am going to hand off to John Beck. After the, I'm handing off to you right now. And you can do the crosstalk, all right? Thank you. Okay, so thanks for, by the way, all of you for coming. I think that our panel deserves another round of applause before we start talking. So the way this is gonna work is first I ask the panel to comment on each other, uh, just very briefly, and then we're gonna open it up to questions. 
and you know, you'd get to just put your paws in the air and I'll get around to you. As I've joked every other time, it's kind of an exercise program for me. I get to run around the room. But first we'll start up here. So any comments from the panel about each other's presentations just in terms of making any linkages before we move on to, to the audience? Comments? Well, I was actually interested, Johanna, in the, um, the comedy, the sitcom it looked like about German Turks, because it was interesting to me that it came really quite late, right? When you think about Turks immigrating to Germany in the like, 1950s or even you know, that sort of time period. And so I was wondering, but is that, even though it's making fun of the problems, is it actually a kind of sign of some integration in that now we have, there is a video, a sort of sitcom about this. I mean, I think that you're right on in that you don't, you can't have the comedy right at the beginning mm -hmm. because the com comedy requires some level of distance, like Cynthia said, she's all the way back there. Um, yeah, <laughs> she, she made it back there, like. Hustle. Um, there, there's got, you have to have, so, if you're in the moment of crisis, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, then your concern is on survival. But once you have settled mm -hmm. and you have acclimated in some way, you have integrated, mm -hmm. so to speak, then you also have this deep understanding of the host culture that I think allows you to then criticize it from the inside mm -hmm. and create this dual level of, of comedy. So. It's, it's kind of surprising, I think, that it took that long, because you're right, mm -hmm. it's 2010, and it's the first full-length comedy about guest workers in Germany, and the agreement with Turkey is made in 1961. Okay. So that's 50 years. It, mm -hmm. takes fi it takes more than a generation, basically, to get to the point where you have enough distance to laugh about it. Mm -hmm. But I was also curious, actually, it's interesting that we're doing this at the ends of the table because part of me thinks that there's a level of, you have to be aware of your ambivalence, which was one of your key points mm. in the history of the US. You have to be aware of your ambivalence in order to analyze it. And so I was curious if, you know, does the ambivalence stay constant throughout American history or does it kind of vacillate? Right, well, and then does the, the, com the sitcom you were describing is the ambivalence of the immigrants, whereas what I was looking at is the ambivalence of Americans toward immigrants. No, I think that although there is this, I think there is this ongoing contestation, um, I do think that it moves in different, you know, in sort of different ways and, and at different times, and so it, it definitely does change. And you do see really, um, significant shifts. The closing of Alice Island really comes at a moment where the, in the night, sort of, where it comes in 54, but then there's a shift away from restrictionist immigration policies um, in the post-war period of paying more attention to refugees and, and having refugees within immigration policy, but also there's an opening up and an ending of all the, t or not all of them, but an ending of many of the racial restrictions on immigrants, and that is, that's the moment that is the closing of Ellis Island. Interesting. Okay, so I, any I, other comments think, from uh, the panel? You know, part, part of that ambivalence, I think, in, in that delay in integration is, is there are things we like about immigrants or, or immigrant workers sometimes, um, but we don't want everything about them. I, I, the, the famous quote is, you know, we, we wanted labor and we got people, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm yeah, butchering the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the yeah. you know, translation of that. But there's that sense in which, well, you know, we want people here. We want them to be the good immigrant. We want them to work and be cheap labor and get things done for us and then disappear. Um, we don't necessarily want them sometimes to integrate and be part of our society. Um, but then we blame them when they don't, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's this ambivalence as to you know what society expects, and then that's reflected again by you know the Turkish immigrants in this in this clip and and others. It's to say, well, I don't know how much I want to be part of this society that treats me this way um, mm -hmm. and holds me on the outside. Yeah. And, and native-born people say we shouldn't have to change. But we eat hummus, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, we, we love our Chinese food, 
but we don't want to have any more Chinese immigrants. And, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well. Make a comment as the yes. only immigrant in this table. <laughs> no, 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 I'm an immigrant too. We have to oh, think yes, of English yes. people as immigrants. But, that, that British accent is not affected, by the way. <laughs> no, the Greek accent, trust me, it's uh, much more affected. I always said uh, to my kids that they are Americans, that the reason that I survived in the United States, it is that I moved here at the time where uh, uh, we have the replacement of the melting pot with cultural diversity mm -hmm. uh, during the 90s and uh, the beginning uh, of the political correctness. So, oh, and the fact that I came to an academic town. Mm -hmm. So I never felt uh, really discriminated. Of course, I had the uh, usual questions up to now, but I think uh, they are very innocent. When are you going home? Because they immediately assume that uh, from the accent that I'm an outsider. But recently, and here I come with the context and the ambivalence, it is the first time that I have felt uh, an outsider. In very simple interactions, going to the store, I stopped going to certain stores and for the first time in my life I wrote formal complaints to the companies about the way that uh, the managers or whoever treated me. So that uh, ambivalence, mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, you always have to see it in which context and also there is something else, ambivalence to the uh, outsider uh, in relation with its nationality, accent, color of skin or whatever? Or what about uh, the fact that that outsider, class-wise, perhaps yeah. it could be in a higher class than you, mm -hmm. or educated? So I think there are lots of different uh, concepts that they can be discussed. Well, I'm going to just make two quick comments and then I'm looking for hands, okay, coming your way. Uh, one is that in terms of humor, I think Robert Heinlein, the science fiction writer long ago said, um, uh, we laugh because it hurts so much. Mm -hmm. That there's a certain amount of being able to deal with uh, both that ambivalence, the ambiguity, and actually the pain perhaps, of those interactions. The other thing, and Anna and I both happen to serve as historians in a way, uh, me less so than you, and that is that what we know from American history is that white people have had a very easy time assimilating because of the fact that many of us became white people who were not white people before. Mm -hmm. So the Irish, for example, were regarded as non-white and in fact subhuman, And they were able to rise, frankly, by being part of the othering of African Americans and, and others who came in as you laid out. So I think that the issue really is what does the new integration look like where we have people who really do not necessarily want to take on the, the religion, take on the, the language, take on whatever. Look at the debates that we've had about that uh, in the United States for I think for a long time. So I'm coming back here. Let me see that hand again. I saw, there you are. Uh, thank you so much to all the speakers. It was such a fabulous panel. Great representation from the sociology department, two out of five. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just had a comment that links some of the, the comments that have been made about history, and I, my research is on deportations from the US to the Northern Triangle. Um, I think it's really interesting that Dr. Thronson brought up this idea of, of Central American refugees as we know they have not been categorized as refugees despite the fact that they're being, that young people are being slaughtered um, in the Northern Triangle. It's really interesting to think about that historically in the, the history of the Northern Triangle, looking back to the 1980s when we saw the first great waves of migrants, really refugees coming from the Northern Triangle, especially Guatemala, Guatemala and El Salvador where there was People were being slaughtered then and were not considered refugees. And now their children, their grandchildren, their nieces, their nephews are coming again and again being 
um, excluded from a society that, that really created a lot of the challenges that they're facing today um, and that they've been facing for the last 30 years, 35 years. So just to think about that, what we're seeing then is kind of a second wave of refugees that again are being considered economic migrants for no fault except for US um, economic policy. But then I also had a, a quick question for Dr. Thronson, a legal question, something that I've seen a lot has been smugglers saying, well, get to the US before you turn 18 because you're, you have a chance of, of staying. But I, I've also heard that then people can be deported soon after their 18th birthday, especially if the case runs for, for a year. We're looking at now deportation cases that are gonna go into the next five years. So what, what are you seeing in terms of, of people aging out of potentially being able to claim asylum in the US and then potentially being deported? So it cuts both ways on, on asylum in that the, the actual substantive standards for who gets asylum are the same for children as they are for adults. And the standards of proof that we hold people to are the same. So there's some disadvantages to being a child trying to meet standards that were really developed in post-World War II Europe with you know, refugee flows there in mind. And so they don't fit nicely with, with the experiences of, of young people um, in, in you know, modern times and, and closer to home for this to happen. But we do have some procedural protections which are in place for young people. Um, so those who do arrive without an adult or parent accompanying them who are under age 18, for example, have an opportunity to present as an asylum claim in the first instance before an asylum office as opposed to in the court setting. So they get a, a, a slightly less adversarial procedural setting in, in which they can do this. Now, that doesn't mean it's any less difficult to make their case. Um, there's also a, a couple forms of relief that are unique to children. Um, one of these is special immigrant juvenile status. And that generally requires the involvement of child welfare systems in the state court, something that's truly impossible to do for most children without an adult who helps them do this. You don't get to be a kid and just show up in, in court and say, you know, I'd like to be in the child welfare system. I'd like to get a guardian appointed. Um, can you find one for me? You need adults. You usually need an attorney to make this happen. Um, and that has to happen, you know, while people are young um, to, to be able to, to get into a state law child welfare system usually requires that someone is, except for a couple states where they've now expanded this age 21, um, requires that you're under 18. You don't show up as a 19 year old and say, I'd like to get into the child welfare system because our state turns around and says, you're not a child. Okay, we have a question right here. Okay. Recognizing that we have a national history of disenfranchising people, that many of the people coming to our country are underage, are unemployed with the uh, inability to be employed, that they don't necessarily want to learn the American Constitution. What's going to happen immediately and long term if we build a wall? Well, I guess I, I just say I'd question all those premises that you have in your question. I, I don't think our evidence shows us that, that these are you know, young people coming who don't want to learn our constitution and don't want to learn our language. Language acquisition in this country is happening faster than it ever has. We don't always see it because we have more media in our face than Spanish language, for example, right? You know, we didn't have Univision, um, you know, years ago, so we didn't have flipping through the channels. You didn't see the Spanish language channel, but, you know, we're actually, we're, we're such a monolingual country here, I, I think one of our problems is we lose language too quickly. By the time you get to a second generation in this country, kids don't speak the language um, of, of their home country or, or their parents' home country, and it's just gone. And there are ways in which we should value that and hang on to that bilingualism or trilingualism that we have. So I think you know, all our studies are, are showing that, that people who come and are supported and, and find ways to integrate um, you know, have that opportunity to integrate, thrive, and do well, and, and are, you know, really productive members of our society. I, th I think, you know, if, if you break it down and look at it, th these are not people who are coming and draining our economy. They're, they're highly, highly productive. 
But on the question of the wall and border enforcement, one of the things that we have seen each time historically that you do reinforce the border and that sort of maybe started in you know, it's 1917 where it send, uh, sending kind of immigration officers to the US-Mexico border and implementing the policies that have been developed at Ellis Island on the border. So you had this curious situation where at Ellis Island you had first class and second class passengers and they would look at the Mexican immigrants coming across the border and say, oh, you're like a first class passenger and you're a second class passenger, even though these people didn't have tickets from uh, liners. But when they started, and then in 24, you have the creation of the, the Border Patrol, one of the unintended consequences, and immigration policy is full of unintended consequences, um, is that people don't and are not able to leave, right? So in fact, if you are unauthorized in the United States and there's a crackdown, you're going to be much less, much more likely to stay in the United States. And I'm not sort of making a judgment on that one way or another, but it's just something that we do see with any increased border enforcement. And also, net migration from Mexico. Am I on? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can, I can probably, I'm used to, to lecturing to 500, so I can probably just shout to the back. The net migration from Mexico now is about net zero. It's negative. Um, it's yeah. negative now. Because, the, because of the economy, uh, in the U.S., mm -hmm. and the Mexican population is aging. Only people of a particular age are very likely to migrate, and as you get older, that likelihood goes down. As the Mexican population ages, there's fewer people that will come over that they're of the age where they would migrate. So if we build a wall, we're going to spend 23 billion, something around there, <laughs> to keep out nobody. Right. <laughs> And, and I would say this, we, we built different kinds of walls, right? So we built some walls with our, our statutes and, and the, the, you know, the, the perennial, you know, well, why don't people get in line? You know, what, what, you know, why aren't they moving forward? We have really, since 1996, had a number of barriers in place where people who, under previous laws, would move through our system. They're married to U.S. citizens. They have U.S. citizen children. They're completely integrated into U.S. society and life, and they're you know very important to their families here, and they can't get through the system. Um, we have put in place some some just you know insurmountable barriers legally that that keep them on the outside and keep them not part of our society um, moving forward. And and these are things that you know used to be right. If you uh, um, uh, there, there's a, a great author, Maine Guy historian at, at Columbia, who who has a, a short article out there saying, you know, how grandma got legal. And um, just looking at, at historically how many of our ancestors came in ways that are exactly the same as people are coming today, yet the system found a way to, to legally accommodate them and move them through the system. And, and we just can't do it today. Can I make a comment on this? Uh, for me, it is very important that we started uh, this panel with a historical framework and it is keeping repeated. Based upon my research in Greece, uh, and comparing with the American uh, society and the reaction that uh, they have towards refugees, I would like to make a point that I think it's very interesting. What we need to think at this point it is not, it is definitely the various executive orders because based upon those people are suffering, but at the same time, the ideology that these orders represent. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, United States and the majority of the Western nations, they were always uh, into the realm of cosmopolitanism and in, in terms of uh, uh, international relations, they were coming more with the so-called rights approach. So for the first time, we see United States trying to move uh, to an extreme isolatism, not only from its neighbors in the, with the format of wall or whatever, but from uh, legitimate international organizations, just like United Nations, 
where they try to pull out uh, the expenses uh, that, uh, excuse me, the support that they give to them. So for me, it is also a, a very important ideological uh, uh, explanation, a, a, an ideological topic mm -hmm. that we need to discuss it further. The second topic that I realized, it is the role of memory, the role of history. And for example, in the majority of the European countries, history it is very big, very important in the formation of the identity. Germany, for example. Mm -hmm. Even now, in the children, the children they are taught about Hitler and Nazi and all of the problems that they created, the Nazis. Yes. In the United States, history, I think it is avoided. And uh, I'll give you examples through my children and the way that they went to the American school here. For example, if they will take a, a history class, it will be a, what is called that one, PE, that uh, honors option, and then uh, they can get in the university. Uh, but usually the teachers, when they teach those, uh, they teach based upon the exams that they will take, uh, and not about the substance. Secondly, Mr. Trump was elected with the whole idea, let's make America great again. Which America? Which great? We are talking about the 50s. Because, yes, at that time, it was the time that America was great. Why? Because we didn't have any other competitor except the Soviet Union at that time, economically. We were the producers, we were exporting everywhere, and so on. So the big question for me, it is, the absence of memory, which is one of the questions that elderly people are asking me in the island of Lesbos when we go with the students and we do several fundraisers or we try to help, they laugh at us. They look at us and they say with a nice way, huh, the Americans start the wars and now they are getting our soap so the refugees they can be washed. Because in their mind, they are responsible for what happened in Afghanistan. In, in the island of Lesbos, the first refugees arrived in 98 with the Taliban. And then from 2000, we have an escalation of refugees after every war, either it was uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, and so on. So, I think we forget very quickly, and it can be explained, let's not forget that in this country, it is also the country that really flourished the discipline of psychology. Now, Sophia, I'm going to... I'm sorry. Uh, no no problem. <laughs> oh, my God, I see the I'm professor sorry. coming out in you, perhaps, right? It comes out in all of us. So I'm going to turn to this young man right here. Um, my question's for Dr. Gordon, and specifically about the entire panel. It's free to talk on it. Um, when I think about the recent executive orders, um, it seems to me that they are uh, predicated on a fear not just that immigrants from the handful of predominantly Muslim countries um, won't assimilate, but also there's a, a fear there of like a, you know, an attack, you know, and I'm, I'm wondering then if, you know, this sort of cyclical discrimination of our past is really analogous, like if we have anything in our past that is, yeah, they, that can square quite with what we're looking at today. I would say I mean, clearly national security has come to the forefront in, in a very significant way. Um, and for um, understandable reasons. I think if we're looking to history, perhaps, you know, in 1905 there was a ban on anarchists and um, people who intended the violent overthrow of the United States. And there was deportation, uh, extensive deportation during the um, 
you know, First World War time period of professed anarchists. It was, you know, and so that was definitely part of this concern about violence. And, and national security. And then the other real sort of time period that I would say is, is during World War II, right, with um, the incarceration, the imprisonment, um, and the internment of, of Japanese uh, and German and Italian nationals initially, which is what Ellis Island was used for, and then um, the imprisonment of uh, Japanese Americans um, in the West Coast. But, one of the really, I think, significant parallels there is that no um, Japanese Americans were ever found to have committed any acts of sabotage, right? Which is very similar to um, the situation with these uh, Muslim majority nations that have been banned. And yet, at the time, uh, people said, well, that's the problem, right? The fact that they haven't actually committed any acts of sabotage is just a sign that they are sleeper cells controlled by the Japanese government waiting to commit an attack. So nothing the Japanese Americans could do would make a difference because had there been some form of sabotage or some kind of attack that would have been obviously cause and the fact that there was no sabotage or attack was also cause and I think that's very comparable to what we're seeing today with this sort of level of anxiety that even no, no evidence, right, of, of and anyone from these nations uh, having committed sort of attacks in the United States is still not enough to, well, it, it's not enough to prevent the executive order from being issued, although that is one of the key grounds on which it's been enjoined. Is that the correct term? It has been enjoined temporarily. Okay. <laughs> it's been restrained. We have a yes. temporary restraining order. Right. So, so one of the things historically, just to note, that's different right now, or not mm -hmm. different, but we'll see where this goes, is that courts have been very hesitant historically to step into what is viewed largely as a political realm. Mm -hmm. And they have deferred to the executive and to Congress in terms of how they go about deciding who gets into the country and who doesn't in ways that completely violate some of the norms that we generally hold when we think about what's constitutional and what's not. Mm -hmm. And we let our executive and our, our uh, you know, legislative bodies get away with things in those realms that we wouldn't elsewhere because the courts are hesitant to step in. This is an interesting situation. You know, how far do you go in, in what you know, I would say is a fairly irrational choice. Not, not a choice to say we want to make the country safe, but to implement it in a way that doesn't make a lot of rational sense. And most of our, our former you know, security personnel and, and diplomatic personnel have stepped in and said the same. You know, this, is, this is crazy. This is how we're going about doing it. But will the courts ultimately, as this goes up through the court system, be willing to take that judgment? and say that that's right, or will they defer to the political branches and mm -hmm. say, as they historically have in many of these settings, well, you know, we don't necessarily agree, but mm -hmm. it's not the place of the courts to come in. And, and that will be an, an interesting thing to watch as to where this set of cases and these sets of issues fit into the historical framework. Okay, we've got a question right here. Okay, so um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for coming to present on your topics because they are um, very helpful, especially to like what we're learning right now. But, um, so my question is directed specifically to Professor Schuster Craig um, because you talked about integration and assimilation and we talked about that in our James Madison classes. And so um, a question that was ra raised in our classes was, um, like, is it fair for a state to ask those who want to be citizens to integrate or assimilate as it means they might have to forget their culture and their cultural identity and values? Because this was a question that very much, like, I didn't know how to, like, in my James Madison classes, they were just, it was a challenging question for our class. So I just wanted to see your perspective on it specifically. I think for me, it's really hard to distinguish between integration, what it could possibly mean in the most positive sense in the world, and, and integration as it's actually used. So I think that 
like you were saying, integration almost always means assimilation. It's a way to try and not say assimilate <laughs> and to use a nicer, a, a quote, nicer word. Um, some of the radical activists, especially people of color in Germany, have started saying, don't even use the word integration. Talk about participation, talk about access. Those are the two words where we can actually measure what's happening, where we can then share in the vision for what we want society to turn into. But if you talk about a part being incorporated into a whole, if you have to take me and then incorporate me into your whole in order for this whole to function, then we don't want to be part of that whole because that's not actually a forward-looking grouping. Um, so in terms of what the state can demand, I would, I would maybe prefer to think about what the state can facilitate. So I think language classes are absolutely necessary, 100% necessary. You must provide, you can't just expect that language acquisition will happen on its own. And without language, there's no upward mobility. So if you want a productive workforce, you have to make sure that there's some kind of expectation that the state will provide these benefits mm -hmm. in order to allow people to become productive forces. And that's, that's one of the critiques that I have about German integration politics writ large, is that to me it seems like a system that's based on a racial hierarchy. Not everybody is asked to integrate, right? I am American. My parents don't speak any other language but English, and I have this weirdly German name, and I speak German. And when I go back to Germany, it's like I have returned to the mother ship. They want to give me things. They want to offer me things. They congratulate me on how well I speak German. And oh, surely you have German ancestors. Well, yes, four generations ago. But I mean, I, like, I don't even know what you want from me in this space. And it is just because I am white, and my name is Johanna. Like, that, that is the basis of what they are offering me. Nobody asks me to integrate, right? If you show up and you are perhaps Afro-German and one of your parents is ethnically German, you are integrated, right? Your parent is German. You have grown up in Germany. You have citizenship. You are part of that country. And you are constantly asked to integrate, to assimilate, to be part of the state. So that kind of compulsory power that I think, you know, economics doesn't trickle down, but cultural discourses sure as hell do, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of cultural pressure, I think, is un unnecessary for a state to want to compel and yet all of the politicking is around compelling precisely that kind of assimilative desire. I was just wondering uh, what your opinions are on how to best support, as an individual, uh, how to best support refugees that are uh, living locally and uh, in other countries. <laughs> so resettlement is, is super important. It, it provides uh, permanent, uh, permanent protection for uh, a certain number of refugees and it provides an escape valve uh, for pressure that's building up in places where there's large numbers in Greece and Turkey, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, etc. But less than 1% of the world's refugees will ever be resettled. So most, it, 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 I think, you know, there's, there's the kind of one-on-one -on -one thing. There, there's great organizations here in the Lansing area that you can volunteer with to work with ref refugees. And I think if you want to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship with folks to really help them, you go through those organizations. Lots of faith communities uh, are involved in this kind of work, and that's great. If you, want, if you want your government to do something about worldwide refugee crises, we need to stay in the United Nations. I'm very concerned that uh, the sort of, uh, you know, uh, fear of a world government, I mean, if you've done anything with the UN, they are really far away from being a world government. <laughs> right. 
really, really far away. So, uh, you know, I, I think making sure that we stay there, that the uh, Security Council uh, has uh, member states that are, that are not aggressor states. I mean, Grin, we're in it, so, um, and we've got, you know, we've got some, we really need to, to, to do something about our over-militarization, but uh, we need to be, we need to stay a part of that. We need to support it. We need to actually pay our, our UN dues, regardless of how we, what we think the, the, um, you know, the family planning practices of UN agencies are. We need to support the UN because I, as, as much as I will critique the UN, and I will critique the UN a lot, I think being engaged with that international, transnational conversation uh, and supporting both the UN and international NGOs that are doing the lion's work of, of refugee assistance in these what we call secondary, second countries of asylum. So they leave their home country and they go to these places that are never us, even with Central American refugees, mm -hmm. we're getting very small numbers proportionate to our population. But, but countries where, like in Jordan, where like one out of every three people, it might be more than that now, are refugees. Those countries need our help. Those countries need support of the UN and the international community. We cannot stop being part of the international community because we fear this boogeyman world government stuff. And, and I would just add, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I would add, too, that when we think about um, refugee populations, we, we need to broaden our focus a little bit. Um, yeah. We have three executive orders right now. We've probably got some more to come. Um, and, you know, people other than refugees, immigrant communities other than refugees, are going to get hit hard in some ways that, that need support and, and people need to, to step up and find ways to help other immigrant communities. There are some, some very scary things that are floating in some of the January 25th orders that we don't see in the prominent, focused way that we've seen the reaction to, to refugees coming in at an airport where there's a, a place and a time um, and when this goes. Even that order from the 27th has hit students here at this campus who aren't refugees. They're finishing up a PhD, but they're not sure if they can or not, or what happens if they have to go home. And so, you know, just being careful that we don't focus in too much on the ultra-sympathetic, high-profile refugees to the extent that we forget and, and create a hierarchy of, of, you know, who's important and who deserves our attention, and then, therefore, other people don't. Can I, uh, yeah. sorry. Can I also, can I also jump in on that? So, I, I'm really sympathetic to what David is saying, and I know that this is an event for immigrants and refugees and migration and these topics that are in our news all the time, but we live in a state that has substantial rural poverty, that has a water crisis in Flint, and that has a failing Detroit public school system. There are other issues besides refugees that are local that demand your engagement and demand your help. So one of the things that I am very concerned with, especially at the university, is that we are constantly, I'm in German studies, we are constantly trying to get people abroad. We want to send them to have exciting experiences, and that is great. You learn how to be a global citizen, but you have to be active here. It doesn't just happen somewhere else that's more exciting, and that's more thrilling, and that's more fascinating. So there may be, I've seen in some other places that there's an outpouring of volunteers that want to work with refugees and they want to be part of that community. And that's great because people are coming in with all these interesting cultures and languages and everything. But there's also other struggles that are related that might be worth your time and might be in need of volunteers. Bravo. Thank you so much. I got a quick question. Time's running out. One, I want to thank you, but I want to point out Julian Samorian, a great sociologist, mm -hmm. and the Julian Samorian <coughs> Institute here in the bottom of outreach and engagement. Ruben Martinez is a great guy. Yep. Gave me the figures, and he did say we're zero at the border. Yeah. Number two, uh, in 2010 in the United States, according to the Julian Samorian Institute, that there were more Latino babies born than any other race. My question to the panel is quickly, the last election we saw, to be blunt, globalization versus anti-globalization. And, you know, 
us here, we're on the globalization side, I would guess most people are. So my question is, because I was in ed leadership for eight years, what about diversity, inclusion, social justice, wholeness, multiculturalism, put into the schools at a young age to help this so the next time that we do embrace the other, we do embrace diversity, equality, and inclusion. And I'd like to hear your comments on all that. Thank you. And how does the Latino picture change the melting pot? So I, I'll just quote my favorite demographer, Doug Massey. Mm -hmm. There's no point fighting demography. Demography always wins. <laughs> <laughs> And in terms of your point about um, the education, I think it is really important that we don't learn sort of a history that is more about forgetting um, the, the parts of our history around exclusion um, and deportation, and, and which have very extensively, particularly deportation historically, have affected um, the Mexican-American community in the United States in the 30s and the 50s with Operation Wetback, as it was called at the time. And, and definitely, this is the community that I think is going to be hardest hit um, with uh, the deportation order, along actually also with um, uh, African-American immigrant, African immigrant communities as well, and Afro-Caribbean immigrant communities, because they're so heavily policed that if legal immigrants get picked up for any small infraction, and now this is going to be expanded to uh, picked up for any small infraction, and not even charged. So you could, I guess, theoretically be deported for jaywalking, even if you're not charged for jaywalking. Um, the, this, these are communities that definitely will be impacted. So I think in terms of speaking to the education, though, it's really important that we learn a history that isn't uh, full of forgetting. Let, let me make one comment and then turn it back to Cynthia and the panel for closing remarks. One thing that I, that I think that we could fall into tonight, and I think it's dangerous, is that I want to make sure that we embrace the fact that there are plenty of Americans today with their shoulder mm -hmm. to the wheel for refugee communities, mm -hmm. for immigrant communities, for migrant communities, on the side of justice and everything else. There were thousands upon thousands of people waiting for refugees to come into their churches and into their communities mm -hmm. when people were turned away. So in that way, it's not only one America, in effect, that, yeah. that has that history. There's a multiple layered history of America. Mm -hmm. People who have, have embraced diversity at various points in our history. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a marbled history, though. And the problem mm -hmm. always is that as Martin Luther King said long ago, that the arc of justice, you know, bends, bends long, but it bends toward justice. So mm -hmm. we have to hope that we uh, can work together and do what we need to do uh, in, in light of what all of you have uh, contributed tonight. Let me turn it back over to my colleague, Cynthia, to take us home with the last comments from the panel. As we close out, I want to come back to the education and say it's not just K through 12, but it's higher ed. Mm -hmm. And to the history point, if we teach the true history, which I think we all can admit we don't, if we teach the true history of this country, everything that's happened and everyone that's contributed to who we are as a nation and what we are as a nation now, then it would be a lot easier to move forward on all of these issues of social justice, migration, and, and things of that nature because we would realize that we're not the country we are now based on the back of any one type of individual or any one type of community. And we would acknowledge that we have flaws and blemishes and that's okay as long as we move forward and celebrate the really great things. And so as long as we all commit to the truth of reality. So today will be history tomorrow, right? As long as we commit to the truth of reality and we speak truth, then we begin down that path. And we, we can't push it off on someone else. We can't say that they need to do it in K through 12, they need to do it in college. We all need to do it. And we all need to correct when we hear misinformation. And, and not bring forth our own versions of alternative facts, but speak truth to truth. And with that, I would like to thank all of the panelists for doing a wonderful job this evening. I want to encourage, if you're here,
and you have a question or two for one of the panelists that you come up and talk with them personally. I'd like to thank our students that are here this evening. We always love to have our students come out and be engaged. And to our faithful followers, I will dare to say we love you and keep coming. <laughs> thank you.